uh, Carolyn Walker. Say hi, because you just look like a student. <laughs> among <laughs> <my other> students. <laughs> um, and she was uh, really kind to have us uh, in her studio. I know it's only there. And at some point she can, you know, uh, give us a ride and show us what's going on and what she's working on. Um, so, Caroline, I'm going to just start with, you know, the usual question so far. <laughs> um, and then, yes, I should uh, invite all my colleagues, but especially the students. Please don't be shy. Um, ask because it's a chance to learn. Uh, you can uh, uh, you have here in the in the lower bar uh, Ridika Mona now raise your hand if you want to put a question or just type them on the chat and I will read them out loud or um, or Carol will Carolyn will okay so Carolyn um, I don't know when when you finish your uh, your um, university studies uh, we don't it's not that important what uh, it's maybe more important is how did you feel after you grad graduated uh were you really prepared for what came next and what was the first thing you did to you know to put up a career that you successfully successively have right now as a, as a painter as an artist and um, well i think it was a bit up and down and um, so i did my i do um I think all the students here are all undergraduate, aren't they? Um, so uh, well, I finished my undergraduate degree in 2004. Um, and then after that, I just got a studio and was working part time um, and still painting and just applying for lots of competitions and things like that um, and applying to do an MA. Um, so I came down to London to do an MA in 2007. Um, which I finished in 2009, which was quite a difficult time to be graduating really and starting a career because it was just after the big financial crash. So, of course, there wasn't really like the art market had been like, I don't know, suddenly all the galleries were closing and there was a lot of stuff. We didn't seem to be that same kind of um, setting that you could enter. Um, but I was quite lucky in that I'd. Um, I won a prize when I graduated that gave me a studio for a year and a show at the end of it. So I had this first kind of um, thing to aim for. Um, and I think that really helped me keep the momentum after art school, because I think you kind of build up towards this degree show, like this kind of final point of something. And then it can feel a bit flat afterwards because you're like, then you're on your own in a studio if you've got a studio. Um, and there's nobody kind of motivating you to keep working. Um, but I guess I just sort of, I was, I, I mean, I think a lot of it comes down to being in the right place at the right time or, or fostering the right relationships. Um, a lot of the early points in my career were helped along by meeting um, some curators and writers that really helped me. Um, so Jane Neal, I don't know if you, Right. Yeah, we know Jane Neal. Yeah, so Jane she was, was often in, in Cluj. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and also um, Matt Price. I don't know if you know Matt. Um, he's a writer. It was him that first introduced me to Jane, actually. Um, mm. So I think just it was quite stop and start, though. You know, like you'd get a sort of show and then nothing much would happen for a while. It'd be, I've run out of money. <laughs> what am I going to do? Um, and I'd say there was a few years of that kind of like suddenly it, like, it seemed like you're getting somewhere and then it would go a bit flat again. Um, and I guess the the, probably the proper sort of shift kind of happened really when I started working with um, my gallery in Amsterdam, which was about five, five years ago, something like that. So, um, and then since then it's been very sort of consistent really. <laughs> And um, Caroline, how did you approach all these curators and writers? Uh, just you went straight ahead with a piece of painting under your armpit. 
<laughs> and well, so this is a topic for us, you know, yeah, you don't want to be too daring, but still you want to yeah, get yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a thing I would think it's a bit like dating or something, you have to kind of not look like you're too keen. In the case of Jane and Matt, that was they they got in touch with me because they'd seen my degree show. Um so I don't know. I mean, it's a, that was in 2009, 2010. So it, things are different now. I mean, that's a sort of pre-Instagram kind of time. Um, and I suppose I I made the most of having a degree show and kind of, you know, tried to meet people and give them my card and keep those relationships. And I think that's been quite key. If I've met somebody once and had an interesting conversation with them, I've always followed up and quite a lot of the people that support me um so there's a um there's a kind of art advisor curator that i still work with quite a lot via my galleries but i met them at my degree show in glasgow so that was in 2004 um, and i've kind of now got a sort of friendship with them as well so i think art art is such a kind of environment where it's um, a lot of the people that you kind of work with also become your friends as well. So I think it's been about creating those personal relationships and going out to shows and, you know, trying to meet people. And um, I guess these days we've also got Instagram as a, a big tool. And I know lots of artists that are maybe a bit younger than me that were like graduating in the last five years or something. That's been the way they've been able to sort of launch their careers a bit because I guess that's the um I think even even anchor the way that you're doing these um these sessions where you're looking at an Instagram page rather than a website I think it's a really interesting sort of way of thinking about it because we're now like you said to me before um your Instagram is the way you want to present yourself as an artist kind of thing and it's um I think that's a really great tool to be able to start your career now as well. Yeah, that that's uh, that's a thing that I've been thinking about. That all the young uh, graduate students and uh, the one they enter the university, they can really work this tool out. And who knows, it it might work for them. Yeah. Um, so, Caroline, you go to your studio and. Uh, what do you what do you do there you know to get in the mood you just say i mean you enter the door and buff you just put your hands on the on the brushes the canvas is there and you just go like 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 a you know uh um, like a car <coughs> these days, these days I do not that, or you need like a little warm-up or a little tea or i don't know what you do um, i usually make a little coffee or something but as soon as I come in the studio, so I haven't been in the studio since Sunday and I'm not really that pleased with a couple of paintings I've been working on. So it's slightly dreading getting in here. And as soon as I get in, I'm like, ah, you know, I know what I've got to sort something out on this. And I just can't, I can't even wait to get the cup of coffee going. I'm like sort of trying to fix the thing that I can see is wrong. Um, so I'm quite, I don't, it doesn't take me a while to sort of get into it. I usually kind of launch in pretty pretty quickly um because i can't i can't bear looking at something if i if i know what's wrong with it i just want to fix it mm -hmm. anyway okay do is your technique mainly in uh in oils yeah so i um all the all the paintings are certainly end up with oil paintings but there's um so well, should I, do you want me to talk a bit about my sort of process and uh, of that, or do you, or just what? Yes, uh, I was thinking maybe just uh, put a little uh, screen share, sharing the screen and mm -hmm. to see the paintings, and then I would really love to to see around your studio and you know just hear you talk about what you do right now but i'm gonna share my screen with you all now and just look a little bit at carolyn instagram page um 
So yeah, this is a proof <laughs> that you work uh, in oils. Oh, I'm look, clearly oil oils, right? Do you have a favorite mark of oils? Oh, what do you mean? Oh, sorry, favorite make. Um, Michael Harding is mostly what I use. Uh huh. Um, and as uh, as uh, brushes, which I are your favorite? A, a bit of a mix. I can. I'll take you over and you can see my uh, <laughs> brushes if you like. Um, just pop you on my palette. So I mostly use um. Like the bigger ones, these ones, like um, they're called Omega. I don't know if you can see that. Um, so I kind of use. Yeah, we can see. Um, those are what I'm kind of thing I'm using on big paintings. So I like hog hair brushes for for larger sort of work, um, and quite a lot of these kind of um, what are they called? Is it filbert? You know, the sort of rounded top ones. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know what weight most of them are. I think they're just whatever they have in the art shop. I'm not that fussy. It's more just about the shape and the size of them. I mean, I've got sort of about a hundred brushes or something. So I kind of get through them pretty quickly. And for small paintings or <clears throat> just think, so I um, don't know if you can see, that's a, that's an oil sketch that's on paper. So that's a study for a big painting. Um, with those, I tend to work with them um, quite soft brushes, so black sable brushes mainly. These are Da Vinci, I think they're called, so um, mm -hmm. in all different sizes. So I've got pretty much every one that you can get, you know, every different sort of shape um, of brush for those. So I've got do different sort of types for different sizes. Do you spend time washing them? Yes. Yeah? So every night. Um, oh. Um, like oh, what, what every night I clean. So you, this, is my, minutes. this is my palette. It's very clean. <laughs> um, yeah, every day I like to start like it's completely fresh. Um, I think with the kind of paintings that I make, the color is quite important. That it's exactly what I intend it to be. So if the palette and the brushes aren't totally clean to start off with, then it, you know you're always fighting against that. So. Um, it's my least favorite bit of the day, cleaning up, but, but it has to be done. Actually, your, your uh, colors, uh, I mean, it's pretty easy to see that you have like really bright colors and the colors you use in your paintings are really, uh, even, not, even if it's not a hyper-realistic painting, you do have like a control on your colors. So I assume that uh, keeping your palette clean and starting fresh, let's say, with materials each day, this might be like your technique. So Sorry. it does help, right? It does help to keep all your brushes and your palette, uh, because it seems like in your paintings. Yeah, it definitely helps. I think, you know, the. I need the brushes to stay soft as well. So it's like if you, unless you clean them every night properly, they start getting all you know like stuffed up with paint. I never do that. So. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm really yeah, I don't know. I, I sometimes I prefer to give up on them rather than. Uh, <laughs> Shut them in the bin. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Now I know why you have so many in jars all over the studio. <laughs> exactly. And, and Can nothing... we, how much time do you manage to spend daily in the studio on a regular basis? How many um, hours can you work? Well, I've got a, um, I had a baby a year ago, so I'm, things have been reduced a bit. Um, I now do three days a week in here. Um, and that's usually, um, so I'm, I've come in at nine this morning and I'll probably leave tonight at about seven. Um, so I'll probably try and get three days that are about eight to ten hours. Um, and then if if I can sort of grab a bit of extra time at the weekend, I will. Um, so it's I'm, I'm quite a sort of regular sort of person. I've always liked working during the day um, and preferably working just in daylight. Although at this time mm -hmm. of year, it's not really possible. Have the lights on. Yeah, Carolyn, 
uh, you know, we spoke last night and I said, I maybe it's not so much of an interest to say that, but now that Joanna mentioned it, <laughs> kind mm -hmm. of, the, and also because I see a lot of my uh, girl students here and I think it's, I changed my mind. I think it would be helpful and maybe interesting to say what happened uh, after your time got reduced uh, due to the fact that you became a mother because something very positive happened during uh, with your time in the studio. Yeah, so that again. I'm a lot more productive with the time that I do have, so I'm much more focused. So that's why when you ask me, you know, what do I do when I get in the studio in the morning, I just go straight for it because I know I've only got, you know, quite a limited amount of time. Whereas before, I would probably like come in, made a coffee, looked at Instagram for an hour, <laughs> like sort of. <laughs> Done a little bit of work and sort of wandered off and sort of, you know, gone and had a coffee somewhere else. I mean, so it's um yeah, it's made me very focused on on what on what I want to achieve in a you know, I know my three day week, you know, where do I want to be at the end of that? Um and most of the time my it's quite a realistic <laughs> unrealistic rather um expectation of what I can achieve. But um yeah, I kind of I think it's made me appreciate my studio days more because there's less of them. So the idea is that you can be productive even if you have less time for your art and for your practice. Mm. That yeah, less. You can organize yourself better and yeah. Yeah, and less headspace. I think I, I was quite worried before um, I had my daughter that. I might sort of lose focus a bit or sort of not be able to devote, you know, because I'd be sort of very sort of mentally distracted by having a child to look after all the time. But actually, it's maybe better at um, thinking about um, my work, I think, as well, because I can, so when I'm here, I, it's all I think about, you know. Great. Uh what I, I you told me that you're working on, on uh, a future exhibition right now can you you know show us around a little bit a little yeah, bit yeah. i've seen you have some sketches there maybe yeah, tell yeah. us about the little yeah. process so i've got a show opening in new york um in march which is what i'm working on at the moment so i'll give you a little tour around um i don't know can you can you sort of see see that okay um so these are sketches for a big painting, which um, I'll show you now. Am I far enough back that you can see most of it? Yeah, we can see most of it, okay. yeah. Um, that's a view out of my bedroom window of my next door neighbour pottering around in her front yard. Um, so the, the idea for the exhibition is that it's um it's kind of about my local neighbourhood in London, because, well, like everybody, I haven't been anywhere this year um, and quite a kind of thematically it kind of brings together a couple of things that I've been working with in the last few years um, so I've been making a lot of paintings of women at work so quite a lot of the subjects in this show will be of women at work that I know in my local area like in the shops that I go into and things um, the other ones are more about um, so I live on a housing estate and so these are so this big painting here um, which is the detail you showed of the leaves um, from my Instagram this is from this painting um, I think it was like here or something like that you showed um, yeah these are views from my house of some of my neighbours as they're going around um, the estate and yeah so it kind of mixes this women at work theme that I've been exploring but I've also been making work in the past year that's quite personal to me and um, I just made a big series of paintings which are on show in Edinburgh at the moment about my mum um, doing housework in the house that I grew up in so it's still kind of women's work but it was from a very personal perspective of this is this is my mum and this is our family home um, so now I'm kind of looking at my world in London I suppose um, this is a sketch for a painting that's going to be a bit like a portrait. I don't know if you can see the photo on the wall. Um, so I'm kind of I'm using this photo, but I'll probably change some things and move some elements of it around a bit. Um, 
I'll just <laughs> underneath is where the, the sort of beginnings of the painting. That's an acrylic. Can you see that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so all of the paintings, certainly the bigger ones, have a uh, acrylic underpainting. Mm -hmm. um, and depending on the painting, some of them are much more built up than others. Um, but maybe we come back to that with talking about process a bit more. Um, I don't know if you can see this big painting very easily. Um, this is um, my, uh, my, my husband is an architect and his office is also very close to where we live. Um, so this is the woman that runs his sort of office complex sitting outside. Please, I don't know if you can, if the angle's right on that. It's all quite, it's quite small, my studio. It's all quite tight in here. Um, and then these are a couple of small paintings on board. Um, this is my local cafe. Um, and then that's the same two old ladies with their dog that's in the big painting. Um, so when I was talking about the different brushes, um, it's these smaller ones um, on board that I'm re really using a lot of those black sable soft brushes for. Um, because the surface is so smooth. Whereas with the, um, the large scale works, obviously there's the texture of the, um, the canvas. So I kind of like that rougher um, sort of brush. Um, I think that's all I can really show you because as you can see, I'm, I'm quite stacked up in here. I really, I need a bigger studio really. I don't know where, um, don't know where all the next ones are going to go. <laughs> Yeah, I used to have a really small studio, and uh, yeah, I even I worked in a basement for a while, and it was really productive, productive, and fine. So, <laughs> so yeah, you, you need a larger space. So, Carolyn, do you always have these preparatory drawings, sketches for your? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think I don't know if you saw those there, but uh, <clears throat> so these are some of the ones that I was working on for the the big dark painting. Mm -hmm. um, I might start with something that's really very um, loose with, you know, just sort of sketching out the ideas. So um, this, but I, I take a lot of photographs um, mm -hmm. and it's often the case that um, the painting, the reference for it might be two or three photographs that I'm working with. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm sort of changing, uh, taking the sort of something that's included in one and sort of something that's in something else to put together. So it's these drawings where I'm really working out, oh, well, how do I squash these two ideas together? Mm -hmm. um, and then I think at that stage, I start making, I either go into making this oil sketch, um, which will be where I'm working out the colors and the palette. Um, every painting has got quite a specific palette for me. There's a lot of colors in there, but often it might, the there's like one overriding color that's really keeps recurring and everything um, and of course this is i'm always working from a colored ground so i very rarely work from white and um, so i'm also thinking about well how do i want this color to sit on top of whatever's underneath um, and then i'll be going on to these drawings on graph paper i don't know if you can really see that on the camera there um but some of them are like this was the last one that I think I used before I started the big painting, and it's quite a technical drawing, I suppose, really, because I, particularly with a painting like that, that's got a lot of architectural elements to it. Um, mm -hmm. It's quite important for me that I get that perspective right before I um, get too far into the painting, because I don't want to be shifting big areas of the painting. You know, once I'm well into the oil painting part of it. Um, so I use something like um, this drawing here as a guide to help me make the acrylic underpainting. So that's why it's all squads in paint because it's been used <clears throat> <clears throat> for that. So the acrylic underpainting for me is a bit like that's where I put the structure down and that's where I work out those things that can, are easy to move at that stage because it's really easy to make a correction with acrylic but it's much harder with the oil. Um, yeah. And with, and it's also where I'm starting to build up the colour. So painting it that it's so dark, and um, I don't want when I put the oil paint on it to be going on. So I really like 
um, ground. So I start um, building up. I don't think that it's a pity. It's, it's a pity I don't have something else at that stage in the studio um, to show you. But it may be spend a day making this acrylic underpainting with lots of layers of quite thin glazes almost. Of, um, in this case, it was like all orange and purple. Mm -hmm. And it was like bright, actually, much brighter than the oil paint in part of it. Mm -hmm. So I'm using that to sit underneath the oil paint. Mm -hmm. with it. Um, it's almost sort of blowing through it a bit, or in like um, making the surface quite rich. So I then only have to potentially put one uh, quite thin layer of oil paint on the top in order to get this sort of mm -hmm. quite depth of color that I want. So you always start with this acrylic sketch till you organize everything in their places and then finish with oils. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I <laughs> sometimes change. I mean, that was quite a, well, that one was quite a developed sort of yeah. way of doing it, but for other ones, um, I get a bit impatient with the acrylic bit and I'm like, oh, I just want to get onto the oil paint. <laughs> so I just, I just go on with it. So, um, and the, the, the one that I showed you over there with the, the sort of smaller kind of portrait format one, whereas the sort of just a drawing of the woman in acrylic, I probably won't do any more in acrylic on that one because I think I will it's not like there's big structural things to change and I'm more excited about just getting on to the oil paint in it. So um, mm -hmm. it, kind of, it just depends on the painting, really. Mm -hmm. But normally it's quite, uh, you have uh, a lot of control over the painting, as I see. Don't yeah. cultivate accidents and happenings, <laughs> no? I mean, you, yeah. Yeah. Really, yeah. I mean, things, things do change sometimes because often what I think is going to work on the big scale doesn't. You know, and I have to then sort of think about how to, like, if if I want to sort of keep save the painting, what do I need to do to make it work on that scale? Um, <clears throat> but I think the thing with I'm always trying to capture, I think, on the large scale, often what I have in the oil sketches because those are done really quickly and they're quite instinctive in a way. Um, so, and I want the big paintings to have the same sort of um, feeling of a, a sort of immediacy, I suppose. Um, so I have quite a clear idea in my head, I guess, before I start the big paintings of ideally how I would like them to look. Um, and I'm usually trying to sort of stick to that. So it doesn't, yeah, maybe that doesn't sound like the most sort of creative way of working in a way, because I guess I'm, not allowing myself to go away, like too far away from the plan um but i still find it quite an exciting way of um making paintings for me because there's a lot of pleasure in that sort of how do you get to that with the, the paint itself you know caroline i uh the first time I saw your painting, I think what struck me and what really made, uh, you know, take a, take a second look and then uh, appreciate your painting was, uh, one, the fluidity of your brush strokes. Uh, I mean, you can always wonder if it's acrylic or if it's oils or it's, you know, it has a certain fluidity. And uh, that's one thing. And then I was really, uh, I always wanted to ask you, and now I have the chance uh, with, along with my uh, students, what is the, the technical method or how do you do to obtain this kind of the light, the interior light one, you know, it's a light that happens inside of something. And then you have this kind of light you know, a light that comes from the exterior and uh, through the windows and it's invading space. Oh, sorry, sorry. No, it's fine. Um, uh, you, you need to take the, the call? No, no, I'm just oh, I'm okay. gonna switch my phone off because I- Okay. <laughs> because if you, do, it, if you do, it's absolutely yeah, fine. Sorry, it's not urgent, it's not urgent. <laughs> uh, so because here like, like you really you really nailed it 
lately just just thanks <laughs> you have to say it. Um, so what's what's the deal here how do you get to to make this light to appear like a, a strong you know sunny light that comes from the outside yeah. and uh, you know we can see we can really read in in your painting that uh, uh, it's you know it, it's a light that it's invades the interior uh, and you have so many different types of whites yeah so how what's what's uh, the technique here what do you do um so for that particular painting um i think the light is it comes down to this on um, this sort of underpainting the colored ground and then what kind of whites i'm putting on top um so the <clears throat> For the whole of that painting started off as just a flat, very pale sort of peach kind of color. Um, so I don't know. If, I don't think you can probably really see any of it still shining through in the end painting. But um, maybe just in some of those sort of lightest areas, like in the um, top right hand, the top of the window that's on the right hand side, um, you can maybe see a little bit of it. So there's quite sort of pale color. That's over the whole thing. Um, and by not starting from white, I find that I can then, by adding white into the area that I want to have this really strong sort of sense of sunlight coming through, it makes it much punchier than if it was just adding white on top of white or starting from a white ground and then trying to put a sort of thin wash or something on it. Um, so the way I think this, yeah, when I started this painting, and the same way that I really start all my paintings, I'm always trying to work from what would spatially be the back to the front. So it's almost like sort of thinking about it in terms of, well, what is the space I'm trying to depict? Um, so in that case, um, it's, um, I started putting in what was outside the window and then the window first and then sort of building up the room around it. So for to, for that kind of light, I was using a zinc white, and um, so quite a transparent white, rather than something like a titanium, which you know is very opaque and quite chalky. Um, so kind of just to get that quite um, that, uh, by putting in that more translucent white, I think you get a better sense of light passing through something rather than it just being um, a sort of solid object. So, for example, the painting you've got up there at the moment, the small one, um, the front of that, um, the house is white. So for that one, I was using titanium white because I wanted it to feel like something that's quite solid rather than something that light is coming from or through. Um, so I'm kind of, yeah, thinking about what it is I'm trying to paint. Is it something solid or is it something more ephemeral like light? Um, and um, so when it's an interior of a room, often that might be using more opaque sort of um, pigments um, to offset it against those more translucent areas. I think the thing that, uh, I think one of the things that I learned at art school that's always stayed with me, I remember when I was like 19 or something in, in my second year art school, we had to do a uh, life painting for a week. And we were only allowed to use six colors and um, not including white and we had to make up we had to basically learn how to make up every single skin tone using what seemed like six colors that weren't going to be very good at that you know um but i think it sort of taught me a bit of a lesson that actually it's about how everything relates to each other that is what creates this sort of believable space um, so it's the interplay of the colours and also the sort of um, interplay between opaque and translucent that suddenly makes something solid and something received in other things um, come forward in that pictorial space. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, and still I was trying to... I was just looking at your um photos on instagram right now and uh what is really besides this thing the uh, the way you capture the light even if it's exterior or interior 
uh, you have like a distinctive, uh, you know, sign. Is this loose brush stroke uh, that it seemed like really, you know, it can be out of the place of any time, like uh, spinning and really like it seems like you really painted really fast. But at the same time, uh, you capture this realistic uh, sense of the picture of the of the painting. So, uh, what is your when when do you when do you stop? Like when do you stop not to become too realistic? And um, it's really difficult. It's always the hardest thing. Um, I think um, it's yeah. How do I stop? I think it's a bit easier sometimes to make that decision on the big ones because I've got that oil sketch. And there becomes a point where um, for half of the time that I'm making the work, a big painting, I still think the oil sketch is more interesting than the big painting. And then there becomes this sort of flip halfway through or something where I'm like, oh, actually, like the big painting's got something else in it. Um, and I don't know, it's difficult to say what make something kind of makes me stop what makes it finish because some of that is just about instinct i think which i think everybody has about their own work when they kind of think of course like there's just something about it i think it's done but i think it's not um for me an ideal painting is one where every part of it would be the first shot like it's not overworked and not going back into it um I like that sort of freshness of a, the first sort of attempt at something. And often what I'll do, if it's not working to begin with, um, I make a decision and I just wipe that area off and do it again and I keep doing it. So often, um, particularly on like figures and things like that, I might end up painting the face 20, 30 times or something like that. Um, so rather than sort of like putting it in and then trying to tinker with it, I just make a decision to take it all off because I know it's going to be best if it has that quickness. But sometimes, you know, well, a lot of the time you don't get the quickness right on the first, the first attempt. Um, so it's, I'm always trying to keep that fluidity. Um, and the other thing is a bit of a time scale limit for me so the big the small paintings i tend to make in a day um and i if i have to i'll go back and fix something the next day um but i prefer it to all sort of happen in once i like to work wet and wet so there is all that sort of mixing on the surface between the paint and um, and i think that um it's often the most sort of throw away kind of marks that are the most interesting, I think. Um, so although they're quite planned in terms of their composition, they're not planned in terms of how I'm actually going to execute the, or describe those objects or that space. Um, I like that to be quite fluid. That was my, my uh, next question or rather an no observation than a question, but you already mentioned it, uh, that this type of fluidity that it's shown in your work, uh, I assume comes, also, comes out also from the fact that you paint on wet. You don't, I mean, this is how it looks like, like you, you exploit the, the fresh paint on, you, on your surface. Yeah. Um... I think that's that's one of the things that I like about having that acrylic underpainting, I think, because it, it gives there's something solid and fixed underneath, which I can choose to sort of play with or not. Um, but actually, so the painting you've got up there of the living room, that one, for example, had quite a detailed underpainting because it's this um, quite architectural space of a room and I had to get the perspective right on it. Mm -hmm. um, but because that was fixed in with the acrylic, I could then, with the oil paint, not worry about getting a wall in the right place. I could just enjoy moving the paint around and think about how things sort of sit together. Um, and, yeah, I think, um, again, thinking about that sort of how thick or thin the paint is and then 
sort of playing with that as well. So in that painting, um, the area that's in the reflection in the mirror above the fireplace um, is actually, I think I'd painted quite a lot of that in in the underpainting. So what you see in the, in the finished painting there, there is oil paint on it, but it's so thin and it's really just a sort of few kind of extra things to lift it into the rest of the space of the painting. Whereas mm -hmm. the, wall, the walls of the room itself around it were all quite solidly painted. Um, but I kind of, yeah, I, I, when I'm working on something, I tend to move from area to area. So rather than working on the whole thing at once and then sort of working it all up to the same degree at once, um, <clears throat> I'll tend to work on one area one day <clears throat> and hopefully get that to a stage that it might end up in the final painting. And then the next day I move across onto the next sort of part so that each part has this, is still working within that wet and wet uh, sort of system. Yeah. So I can see here, so the, the light, when you put the light, is it like a, uh, a thick layer of, of paint or not necessarily? I think that one, yeah, that one is quite thick. It started mm -hmm. off with a thin layer, but I wanted it to sit again as like, how is this, what is space I'm describing here? It's a corner with recessed bookshelves, the books, and then this light sitting in front of it. And it's the light source for that. So, um, I wanted the lampshade to actually probably be the thickest bit of painting in that space so that it sat um it really sort of sat in front of of the corner um so for that i think i used will have used something like titanium white mixed with a bit of the and um, that sort of yellow i think it's the indian yellow or something i used was using quite a lot of there to describe the um the sort of diffusion of the light coming from the lamp. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I can see that first when I when I uh, saw your paintings, they were all about, let's go a little further, um, outdoor scenes, but scenes like with, with pools and gardens and um, nightscapes and uh, it was a different different thing and now i can see that you work more on interior interior scenes mm -hmm. and uh, and the light changed a little bit in it got warmer right yeah yeah oh, uh, really, really all of my paintings i start off as these sort of warm peachy kind of pale yellow ground mm -hmm. um whereas yeah they used to be a lot more um yeah what's well, a really different kind of light i think the paintings that you're probably thinking of are a lot of the ones that i made of california yeah exactly i'm um, i'm not finding them right now but yeah, they're quite, it's quite you have to go back quite a way i think it's um yeah because i i because i want to show you i think there are some from i think you must be near some there um yeah maybe uh, anyway now you you've changed a little bit the this is this might be one of them yeah yeah um i think well my, my way of working's changed really um when i was making the paintings of la and quite a lot of those others of outdoor kind of ones i was working with um, models and I was hiring locations and I was doing these quite directed photo shoots with almost um, um, a narrative that I was coming up with and directing and I was working I maybe worked like that for about um, six or seven years um, and but I felt like it was maybe I was getting to a little bit of a dead end with it because I was having to generate all of the narrative and come up with all these ideas. And um, I was kind of designing how this, these paintings would look before I'd really even sort of done anything. Mm. <laughs> and it was always quite a high pressure. So some of these paintings, the ones that you've got up at the moment, um, those were done in this house in the 
Hollywood Hills in LA. Um, and it was really high pressure. I had this woman that was painting come to stay with me there for a couple of days. And we did, all, I had this sort of timetable of all these photos and different outfits and things and all these different scenes that we were going to be doing together um, for the paintings. And I only had, had this really short window to get all this material that was then going to last me for at least a year. Um, and it just felt like so many decisions were being made about paintings that I would be making quite a long way off in a really condensed sort of time space. Um, sorry. Yeah. yeah, I was wondering why did you why did you need you felt like you need all this uh, to direct everything for this theme with uh, Californian spaces and pools and yeah, I think it was something that just came, started gradually. When I was at art school, um, doing my MA, um, I mean, I've always, I've been painting figures and interiors since um, about 2003, 2004. So uh, the sub, my general subject matter has really been the same for a long time. Um, but when I was on my MA, start, I started to, or one of the, I suppose one of the characteristics of doing an MA is that you're expected to kind of pick your work apart and sort of look at all the reasons that you do everything and um, kind of justify them, I suppose. And it became, um, started to think about all the things that um, make us um, read these kind of paintings. So what are we, how are we interpreting what the story that might be presented is? It's, who we're looking at, um, what do they look like, what are they wearing, how old are they, uh, where are they, what kind of space is that, what time of day it is, what sort of interior it has, um, what's the landscape, what's the weather like. You know, so all of these kind of elements, um, I suppose I was thinking about, starting to think about the paintings almost in this quite filmic way of how you construct narrative. Um, and that started at the time um, when I was on my MA, I started working with a, a life model who was, um, oh, she didn't have a permanent home. And every time I went to work with her, she was staying at a different house. She was dog and cat sat for people. And that's kind of how she like sort of had somewhere to stay in London. So every time I worked with her, she was in a different house. Um, and that almost kind of suddenly created this different setting every time and um, she was a constant but there was these different houses and then I got made me sort of think about oh well, what, what do we think how do we think differently about her as a subject depending on which house she's in um, so that after I graduated I think that then started me off on this path of um, I started taking each of those sort of elements I suppose of what it was that might um, construct narrative um, and exploring them with each body of work. Maybe not in a sort of very conscious way, but um, just re exploring different things. Um, and I think the, well, I, I got onto sort of making these quite, um, these paintings of quite luxurious spaces, I suppose, because um, my paintings had always been going down this slightly, um, um, that's the word. They, they always had a sense of foreboding about them, I suppose. Um, and a lot of that was being generated by the kinds of interiors that I was selecting. Um, and I started to think, well, what can you still create that if you have a really beautiful setting and there's a swimming pool and it's all sunny and it's this kind of place that you should imagine is perfect. Um, so I think that's what sort of took me there. And then I gradually just got more and more um, sort of constructed. And I got really into that idea of this constructed narrative and especially with some of the subjects that I was picking. So the this this series of work, oh, there's an example of an underpainting, an acrylic underpainting. Um, mm -hmm. So this series of work with this woman in LA, um, the work itself, this, well, this whole method of making the work of it being so kind of constructed and 
um, contrived in a way, seemed to really fit the character that she was um, in these paintings. So the woman, the model, she's a former Miss America um, pageant mm -hmm. contestant. Um, she was Miss Colorado in 1977. Um, and she was, um, she was a very beautiful woman. She's in her 60s now and she's, but she's still very conscious of her image. So a lot of those paintings were really about this kind of management of this um, personal image as well. And of was trying to sort of hang on to something. Um, so that it seemed appropriate that the paintings themselves would be incredibly managed images from every part of the way that they were put together. Um, but I think that I felt like I was running out of a bit of juice, I suppose, in terms of how much narrative I could sort of add to these. Um, and around the same time, I was, um, was commissioned by um, a gallery in the UK uh, called Kettle's Yard in Cambridge. Um, it's, it's a public gallery. Um, and this was in 2016. They commissioned me to make some work in response to the refugee crisis, um, which was like a, a very different um, topic to what I was working on in the studio at the time. And it really marked a big shift, I think, in the way that I just started approaching my work altogether. Um, it took a long time to work out how I was going to make work in response to that brief. But um, in, in the end, the work ended up being a, a collaboration with a charity in London um, to make a series of portraits of um, women refugees living in London in whichever, whatever accommodation they happened to be in at that time. Um, and I, so I, I went from having made these paintings of this woman in LA where I was controlling every visual aspect of it um, to suddenly making paintings which were all about responding to somebody else's situation and the environment that they were in and their story. Um, well, that's um, um, I think might get some, there might be some of those pictures of it on the Instagram. That's, that's one of the paintings there of one of the women that I worked with. Um, so I, um, she was, that, that one was called Joy, and I went to visit her um, at an apartment she was staying in, which is actually really close to where I live in London. Um, and I hadn't, I think I, I, yeah, I'd met her before, but I hadn't been to her house before. So um, I didn't have really any expectations. I just sort of had to um, come into her house and sort of suddenly use all the, the sort of tools, I guess, that I've developed in that I use to construct images to suddenly look at a different space and think, okay, well, what are the what are the things in this room that maybe tell me about her, or that tell a viewer about who they're um, who they're looking at, and um, what kind of space this is. Um, so that it was a bit of a eye opener, I suppose, just to work in a totally different way like that and made me realize that I'd been spending all these years trying to um, make up make up interesting stories when there's all these people that live really near me in London that like the stories are there you know and I that actually real people's lives are much more interesting than what I was trying to generate in, in myself. Um, and I think that's that's what created this shift um, into where I'm my method of working now, which is much more, I suppose, documentary in in approach. Everything I'm painting and depicting elements of their real lives, really. So, Caroline, I have a short question as well. When you decide to start a new project to work for an exhibition or to de develop a seri series of paintings. Uh, what's the normally the process? Do you just get inspired by walking around in the neighborhoods or are there any narratives or books or theoretical things that inspire you? Uh, how do you change more, topics? Probably more the last, uh, sorry, the former. It's probably more 
<clears throat> um, I think I've always been more um, excited by what's around me and that's what gives me the next idea for something. Um, and some of the things are just one idea maybe leads into another or sometimes I'll have an idea sitting around in my head for ages and it might be to do with a programme I've heard on the radio or an article I've read in a newspaper about a particular um, sort of industry or a particular type of women or something and um, but it might be a while before that actually turns into something that I can think about making work from. Um, so with the current series um, it took me a few months to decide that this is what I wanted to do. I started thinking about what this show might be back in April. Mm. And that was when we were in the first sort of lockdown. Um, <clears throat> and so much of my work relies on being able to um, go and meet people that I don't know, you know, that meets, that often meeting people for the first time or sort of entering a space that isn't um, that familiar to me, like whether that's somebody else's space of work or another person's house or traveling somewhere to do something. So I was a bit kind of stuck thinking, oh, well, that's, none of that stuff's probably going to be an option for this show. Um, so I had to sort of start thinking about um, what is an option and um, if most of the work, work is really reflecting on what it feels like to be in a big city or something or what it feels like to sort of in my life but what do I see as I'm sort of making my way about it's like well this year all I really see is these same few streets right where I live so it's um it's just to make sense that that's what the subject would be for sure so you get out of the house and start hunting for a good idea for a painting <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> So it's quite easy going. See? Good breath. <laughs> uh, Caroline, do you always like make? I mean, I know you have an architect, ex a husband, and it might help. But do you always, as I can see here, well, I like the, I like the one you picked. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, he's there. <laughs> um, do you always like make a uh, a physical sketch of your exhibition? Is that important to you, yeah. or? Yeah. Does it help? I mean, when you when you uh, when you're thinking about the exhibition, uh, does the space when where you're about to exhibit your works uh, interfere with the with the process of your paintings, um, or just the with the arrangement of the? Of the um, if it's an unusual space, so like not a kind of white cube sort of space, then I guess that would be a consideration from the start about what kind of work you know is going to look appropriate in that sort of space but most of the time um most of the shows i'm doing are in you know sort of quite like standard kind of white walled gallery spaces so the models in those cases is much more just about working out scale um numbers of works how a group sits together um so that's something that and I tend not to think about, I never really think about individual paintings that much. Um, when I'm starting thinking about a show from the beginning, I'm thinking about the group mm -hmm. uh, and what the interaction is between those different paintings and different scenes. So um, I'll just show you some, like this is the list I've got on my wall at the moment. I, you probably can't, I don't know if you can see any of the writing on that, but um, I've got the diff these are the different um, subjects that are included in this show. Um, uh, so, like Latteria, that's the cafe. Savoyne, that's the chemist that I'm painting. Paula, that's the room behind me. Got bakers. So, 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 these are the different subjects. And then I've got a list of what I imagine I'm going to do with each one. So, I'm thinking I'm going to do two big paintings of the cafe because one of them's going to be a night scene from outside the other one's going to be an interior scene um like another one you know big painting the chemist and then the small one that's a portrait so I'm, I'm working out numbers of paintings and thinking about what's the what does this series of work look like in my head you know what's the balance of inside outside different times of day different types of subjects um so i use the model really as a way um so I, my 
what, one of the um, trainees in my husband's office has just made me a very nice model of the gallery in New York, um, which is a bit terrifying because it's a lot bigger than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's good for me to have it at this stage. So this, um, probably this week or next week, I'm going to, now that I think I know what most of the paintings might roughly look like, I'm going to print them to what scale I think will probably work and put them into this model and see how that looks. And at that point, I might make a decision, OK, well, that doesn't work. So let's get rid of that and replace it with a different type of image. Or maybe I need more sort of a certain size, which, um, yeah, I suppose that all sounds quite sort of maybe controlled about what the thing will look like at the end. But I find that that's the easiest way to work for me. Um, to be in control of the whole group, you know, from the start, really. Yeah. Uh, because we are uh, we are talking now for an hour, uh, and we are approaching our uh, the finish of this uh, this uh, art talk. I'm gonna go to the questions we have here, like two, but maybe more. And my friend Julia Tokac, who's in US right now, said. Dirty dishes never look this good. I suppose <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, it was while I was binging through your uh, to your images on Instagram, and she's right, actually. Um, <laughs> yes, uh, but I have a student, a second year student, uh, which I salute. Hi, Maria. She's asking, when do you think your career began? At what point? I, I think she meant maybe when did you feel like you're, uh, you know, you're valid on this field in the business art world, and and you you felt like well, this is something happening. Like someone bought your painting, you're about to have exhibition, like books we've seen. So, um, I you think can pinpoint that that moment or not? It's difficult to say think of like I don't think it happens of a particular kind of moment um maybe it does for some artists but for me it's been like a really slow kind of um incline you know going up I, it wasn't like there's a sort of wow a particular moment um and I've been lucky in that I've always sold my work since I was a student so there was always that sort of element of like well I know I can you know, somebody's going to buy these things. So, like, I can probably sort of just about survive or something. Oh, hang on. Sorry, I've got just plug my laptop in. Um, but I reckon probably about maybe about 10 years ago, um, I think after graduating from Royal College, I did feel that there was some, enough of interest in my work. Um, it was about 10 years ago that I met people like Jane Neal. Um, and that's when I started showing quite regularly. Um, I suppose it still, it felt like maybe it was a little bit shaky, but I, I thought I would always have some sort of career as an artist at that stage, whether it would be, you know, whether I'd be successful or not, I thought I'd still be able to make, always be able to make paintings. Okay. And we have another question from a dear student of mine from uh, our theoretical department, Juana Dico. Uh, and you can see why she's asking that, because she's studying uh, curatorial practices. Hi, Juana. Uh, do you think it's important to exist a close relationship? Because a relationship is obviously there between an artist and a curator and a gallerist. But She's she's saying, is it important to exist a close relationship between an artist and a curator, or is it just a, pro, a cold professional one? Which one do you think works better for you, for example? For me, um, it's difficult. Sometimes having a very you know close personal relationship with somebody can make things difficult if you don't agree on things or you have a sort of I don't know a different take on how you should approach things. Um, I have a, I have quite a close relationship now with my um, the galleries that I work with, like per personal relationship, and I find that that's really good, great. I really like that. It feels like we're working together as a team, um, and I think that that's 
um, the same, probably the same for the curators as well. So somebody like Jane, who started off as a sort of work person, became uh, a really close friend of mine. And I actually met my, her, she introduced me to my husband. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> I think that kind of thing can work really well. But I think it's about having um, relationships with lots of people as well. I don't think it's um, necessarily that productive just to have this sort of one person that you have this conversation with because I think the thing that makes you you're, you progress as an artist sort of in terms of your work and as you know aside from your career or anything like that is having lots of different kinds of conversations with different people and getting input from different places. Mm. So uh, a, a conclusion would be it's nice to have a close relationship with a curator, but it's also until other students maybe f uh, think about another question. I will uh, ask you a question. I've I, I can see I've managed to make a little uh, tradition here. I start with the question and then I end up with the same question I put to all my guests. So I'm gonna ask that uh, question to you also. Uh, if you would go back in time and you would see yourself like uh, in the first year of uh, university or second, or I don't know, would you have an advice for yourself or uh, Maybe that would be the same advice you would give to my young students that are here to to listen and to talk to you. Um, now you're think, wiser, of course. Yeah, <laughs> I think if I could go back in time, I would have um, been stopped to hang around in the pub so much. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think I'd have like looked being more confident about what it was I was interested in. I think when I think back to um, my like time at art school in Glasgow, I don't think I really found my feet until I was like six months before I was leaving. Um, and that's when I found my subject. But by that point, you know, it was nearly over. Um, and I think I spent the first three years feeling very unsure about you know, who I was, what I wanted to paint, how to paint it. Um, and wasn't confident about looking at, th looking at the art that I was interested in. When I think I knew what it was, you know, I think when I look back to the things I liked as a teenager, you know, when I was at school, um, a lot of those are still the same things now, or I still sort of, it's the same things that I liked drawing as a little girl. But maybe I think to be confident in your, um, in your instincts, I suppose, about what it is that who you are as an artist, maybe. Yeah. Okay, so students, uh, be confident, okay? <laughs> <laughs> this Carolyn Walker's uh, advice to you. <laughs> and uh, if you don't have other questions, uh, we have like, it's uh, more than one hour and a half of talking. So if you don't have other questions, just uh, we're gonna say thank you to Caroline being here. Come on, it's your last chance to make a question. If not, <laughs> yes. And uh, thank you. One hour and a half of painting, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> From your time. <laughs> yes. we are cool. Exactly. So, uh, thank you for being here to with, with us and uh, having a chat with us. You see, you didn't have to prepare any PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, PowerPoints are boring anyway. It's much better. Fresh yeah. in the studio. Exactly. And yeah, it's really nice. We wish you a lot of success and uh, with your uh, future exhibition. Thank you. Um, we and you know just stay stay close to us keep in touch maybe from time to time you know uh, let's have a chat uh, online for our students because at these hard times our studios are closed and as you say as you as you, oh sorry <laughs> uh, as you saw my colleague is very skeptical about uh, 
open up the, the studio <laughs> in January. I was hoping for that, but you know, bummer. Um, I think it's really difficult for, for students to stay motivated in this time. Yeah, yeah. As you said, uh, when you're in school, uh, it doesn't really matter that much if you have, um, uh, if you're in the mood to paint or not. You always have the professor there to, to bug you and to say, come on, you have to paint, you have a deadline. Uh, and now we're not, we are not there with them and we have to motivate them through online, which is harder. Uh, but I still hope that talking with, with artists, with you and Justin and uh, other fellow artists might uh, let them see that art can still happen, even if uh, we are isolated, and uh, that it can also be good, like really good. So so thank you again for your presence. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for being here and hopefully we will see each other again uh, on in our next uh, artist talk. Okay? Cool. Great. Thank you for turning on your cameras. It wasn't so painful, was it? <laughs> <laughs> you look all fresh, nice and beautiful. <laughs> okay, Caroline. Bye.